super excited about this discussion today with uh, perhaps uh, some of the people that, that see uh, what could be clearer than most. Um, it's 2020, so you know, let's, let's get some 2020 vision <laughs> about what is to be. Uh, we're gonna have a, a really exciting discussion uh, about the future of our planet and the future of atomic energy and, and how we can get there. Um, great, all right. So uh, as we go along, feel free to throw a question in the Q&A section. We'll, we have uh, some time budget for questions uh, and uh, we'll have a, I'm sure we'll have a really good discussion. Um, before that happens, we have some presentations lined up. Um, the first of which is from a uh, now somewhat longtime collaborator and, and good friend of mine, uh, David Watson, who uh, edits the uh, Generation Atomic uh, blog uh, by, by Moonlight, I guess, uh, in addition to his day job, uh, and has uh, put forth a lot of really interesting content um, about uh, where we are now and, and where we, we could go in the future. Um, so I think uh, without too much uh, further ado, I'll uh, hand it off to David. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much, David. It's all yours. Thank you. Uh, Eric, I'm, I presume you're going to share my slide deck. Yeah, I, I can absolutely do that. So I think it always helps to give, to understand where a presenter is coming from. So as, as Eric said, my name's David Watson. I am a, a nuclear safety engineer by training. Uh, I live in the UK and for the last couple of years, as Eric said, I've been writing and I've been the editor of the Generation uh, Atomic magazine. One second. So I wanted to share today uh, some of my thoughts on, on how I see nuclear image problem just to get uh, today's discussion going really. So if you go to the next slide, Eric. Yeah, certainly. So civilization, human civilization is a very complex thing. There's almost 8 billion people of us out there now, and, and almost everything we do means interacting with at least one other person, right? We all work in teams. We all, we have clients. We have to negotiate in crowds. So imagine if every time you interacted with someone, you had to explain from first principles what you wanted them to do. Now, that would be pretty difficult. Imagine driving in your car, you come to a T-junction and someone's got to be literally standing there to tell you to stop. So we don't do that. Instead, we communicate using symbols. Next slide, Eric. Okay. So symbols come in in all shapes and sizes really and that they're everywhere in your life and once you start thinking about it but all symbols share one thing in common they're they are a, a simple representation that acts as a shortcut to some deeper meaning symbols tend to unify things they tend to simplify things so if you take the the christian cross as an example now that's a symbol that brings together under one banner an incredibly diverse Christian world that is often otherwise at odds with each other on many issues. So modern companies use a range of symbols as part of what's called their branding. Now some branding is logos and color schemes um, but not all of it. That's actually only a, really a small part of what branding is. You go to the next slide Eric. A lot of branding is really about showing what kind of people buy your product and how desirable the lives of those people are, how cool those people are basically, and how you could be like them if only you just bought this product or this service. This service. So if we take the example of Apple, Apple has got an, a very strong brand and that brand saves it from having to explain all the time, what it, what exactly it sells, what its values are as a company, what kind of people buy its products, its market position in terms of quality, cost, and so on. And so, and Apple's brand does that for them because they've spent decades and millions of dollars cultivating it. So it's about selling a lifestyle. It's not about, it's not about selling your product really. Which brings me to the next slide, Eric. 
So I think this is just a great, a great little quote. So your brand isn't what you say it is, it's what they say it is. So it's what other people say your, your brand is. Um, mm. You can't just tell me how great your product is. I've got to believe it will somehow make my life better. And, and every time I see technology a technology focused piece of outreach come from a nuclear company or organization, I instantly think of this. And so, next slide, Eric. I, I played a bit of a game a while back and I went on to Pinterest, as you do, and I searched <laughs> for a renewable symbol and I'd search for a nuclear symbol just to see what kind of things pop up. And so if you search for renewables, as you might expect, you get this kind of calming palette of natural greens. You get leaves, the recycling symbol, hearts, solar panels on a green field. And for some reason, a Budweiser, I, don't, I couldn't figure that out. Um, but the nu for nuclear, it's not so positive. It's warning yellows, dripping, oozing stuff. Um, for the public, nuclear means the terror of nuclear war, fallout, apocalypse. And whether you think that's, that's fair or not, it doesn't really matter because that's, that's where we are. And next slide. I started to think about, you know, what is it? Why do people, what's, why do people like renewables so much? I mean, why is it, why are they so popular? And I thought, I, I kind of came up with this, this equation. The scientists out there will like this. Um, I think renewables branding has this kind of three part equation. So it's nature plus harmony plus innocence. So if you think about it, whenever you see, say, a renewable product advertised, you'll always see something from nature. You'll see trees, you'll see sunlight, running water, blue skies, something like that. Then they will show you how the renewable product can exist in harmony with nature, how it can integrate into the world around us. Maybe solar panels on the roof of your house. Um, the final part of the equation is the innocence. So maybe it's a child chasing a butterfly or it's a family on a day out or it's a, it's a kid playing with a pinwheel, particularly if it's wind power. And so, you know, renewables, the renewables industry didn't create a desire for nature, harmony and childhood innocence. You know, we all share those values. That's something that's always been there. The clever thing that they did was to tie their product into these desires. And what's happened now is this imagery from renewables has actually entered into the public conscience, the, the zeitgeist. So the product now actually sells itself in a way, and that works in favor, uh, in, the, in favor of renewables companies. And that exact same effect works against nuclear. Because the public perception of nuclear, as we've seen, is not great. Next slide, Eric. So there on the left, we've got some kind of typical renewable advertising. There's a kid with a pinwheel, the innocence, the harmony, nature, boom, all there. On the right, this is literally the type of thing you have shown in advertising for nuclear. So what do you think people feel when they see this kind of chaotic mass of cranes and rusting metal. Now scientists and engineers can get excited about it. You know, I look at that and I think, oh, that's cool. But most people just think, what a mess. And, and going back to this idea of symbols or shortcuts, what, what shortcuts about nuclear do you think this kind of imagery is creating in people's minds? Next slide, Eric. But it wasn't always like this. In the old days, I guess before the 1970s, people were quite excited really about the idea of a clean, abundant nuclear energy that was going to replace coal and solve all the air pollution problems. And nuclear wasn't, it wasn't just a means of producing electricity actually, it, it was seen as a gateway technology to a, a futuristic lifestyle. Next slide, Eric. So what happened? Well, we stopped dreaming. We stopped dreaming about what nuclear could do, the amazing things we could achieve with nuclear technology. Why exactly did that happen? Um, uh, that's very complicated and a long story, but I think we can definitely say it did happen. Next slide, Eric. But there, you know, there, there, there are some bright spots. Um, 
the, there's the kind of work that Kirsty and Eric are doing that they'll be talking about later. Um, and Carnful we'll be hearing from as well. And you know, there's a few a few years back, uh, Third Way put together some really beautiful concepts that try to show what kind of lifestyle new advanced nuclear might enable. And that's one of their images on the left there. On the right, it's a more recent image that's from Oaklo, it's their Aurora powerhouse concept. And that's clearly designed to kind of welcome you up those steps into some sort of cozy temple of clean energy, which is fantastic. And uh, next slide, Eric. So I think this question, this next question here, is really the heart of what we we should be talking about today. So how do we how do we get beyond talking about just raw technology offerings from nuclear? How do we get people talking about what kind of lifestyle nuclear enables? Yeah, I'm happy to be here today to talk about it. I don't have the answer. Um, and just here as a final slide there, um, this, so this, this is kind of an ongoing project for me, this idea of new dreams. It started as an article and then I turned it into a Pinterest board. So please go on to Pinterest, follow uh, new dreams for nuclear. Uh, and get in touch with me as well if you want to contribute to the board if you've got ideas and also if you're a good writer please do get in touch and um yeah it'd be great to to have some new writers for the, for the generation atomic magazine thanks thank you david uh much obliged um yeah i uh, you know i think we're we're used to zoom meetings where these questions are um, more rhetorical in nature. <laughs> um, but as we go along, I, I actually think, um, I think we're, we're getting a little bit uh, better at this as a, as a now more uh, online community than we have been um, before. But we, to utilize uh, this technology in a, in a new way uh, is, is really exciting for me. Um, so yeah, as we go along, we certainly, couldn't do this if it was in person and just have people, you know, shouting, uh, like, it looks like pollution or whatever. But um, as we have uh, this chat box here, feel free to, to use it. And, and we're all, all the panelists are, are, are tuned into that as well. Um, uh, before we go to our next speaker, John, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, talk about something, um, tying to something that, that David had mentioned. And uh, that's uh, how the, the industry used to talk about this technology. Um, I'm a, kind of a, a fan of that atom punk retro futuristic uh, motif. And uh, recently I saw uh, this on sale uh, on eBay. It's, a, it's called Inside the Atom. It's a uh, 1953, 1955 uh, comic. So before we had even built a commercial nuclear reactor, um, and it's imagining the world that that could be. And uh, you know, there's there's all all kinds of stuff you you might imagine of uh, you know nuclear uh, merchant ships, uh, things like that, uh, helping out with with agriculture. Um, and it also uh, helps us stay a little bit grounded where the the little boy in the in the story is is imagining um, uh, you know nuclear jetpacks on the moon, and uh, this guy's like, oh, hold on, Johnny. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, so, uh, on, on that theme, Eric, I've got the the Disney Our Friend the Atom book from oh yeah that accompanied the film from made in like the nineteen sixties. Oh. Uh, so yeah, even you know back then, you know, Disney, even Disney was was all over it. Disney wanted a nuclear reactor to power Disney World, Florida. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you imagine if we had only continued on that trajectory, uh, where where we'd be at today? Um, well, great. I think that queued up our our discussion uh, nicely here. Uh, next, we have uh, John Alberg, uh, co-founder of Swedish 100% nuclear electricity procurement company, uh, Cairnful Energy, uh, and uh, I think the the reason I asked John to to participate in this discussion as I, I see the, um, the the business that that he's in as kind of setting up a little bit of a uh, intellectual framework for how we get from here uh, to you know maybe the world that this was imagining and and then some of the images that David was showing 
Um, so I'm really excited to hear uh, a bit more about uh, their progress and, and how things are going. So uh, take it away, John. Well, thank you, Eric. And uh, hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm going to try to share my screen as, as, it's, as it's supposed to be done. Um, is that okay? Is everyone yeah. watching that? Great. Um, so thanks again for having us. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Carnful Energy. It's a bit absurd that you have heard of us at all because we that that was never the original idea for for this uh, startup uh, but things happen very quickly so I'm John uh, I'm Alberg I'm the co-founder of Harnful Energy um, and uh, we're a lean green energy startup out of Sweden um, started uh, in uh, August of last year 2019 me and uh, my co-founder Christian uh, Schollander um, after many years abroad uh, came back to Sweden and wanted to um, uh, power our lives with nuclear energy and there was no offer <laughs> available on, on, on the market. It's a longer story than that, but basically uh, we're, we're both uh, very much uh, tech evangelists and, and uh, you know, very, very intrigued by, by uh, uh, energy and nature and all of the things that, that lead to understanding how nuclear energy has such a big role to play. So uh, being entrepreneurs and good friends from, from way back when, we decided to, to um, do something about it, um, trying to help build nuclear energy in Sweden at that time um, up as a more popular uh, choice, if you like, um, uh, amongst these uh, various electricity suppliers. So in Sweden, it's, uh, I think, 4.7 million households. So I, we have a population of about 10 million people. So 4.7 million households, and we have 140 some electricity suppliers active in the Swedish market. And um, up until we set up our, our company last year, there were none um, selling nuclear energy um, uh, uh, exclusively, um, so or explicitly at least. Um, so we did this. We we joined forces with some really good developers and um, some good brand agencies uh, that we've worked with before. So our past past experience is not from the energy industry whatsoever. Uh, Christian is from uh, private investment and and wealth management, and I'm from the digital security world and and payments and and um, communications um, for various companies. So before Carnful in Sweden. It was impossible for people that are, you know, we call them rational environmentalists, but people that uh, that understand uh, the challenge, uh, um, uh, you know, a little bit deeper than than what you get on the surface. Um, there was no way for for us to show our support for nuclear energy as consumers. I mean, we could join all these great panels and we could talk to 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 to, to each other on these very. Um, uh, you know, good Facebook groups, etc. But there was no way for us to prove and to choose and to power our lives. So, so we set up a company um, which allowed Swedish households uh, to, to vote with their wallets, if you like, um, while minimizing emissions. And this is actually a worldwide minimization because Swedish nuclear power is now in the latest uh, life cycle analysis. It's down to incredible 2.5 grams of um, carbon dioxide per uh, kilowatt hour. So it's, it's, it's uh, an incredibly uh, uh, emissions-free um, electricity that we are selling. Um, and of course, we also support science. I will dig into that a little deeper, um, but that's, uh, that's, that's a very big part of what Carnival Energy wants to stand for. And it turns out that we could create the service, uh, you know, saving money for people and also time because there's, we, we put some good innovation in place. The way we're doing it, um, uh, you know, how do you provide someone with 100% nuclear energy? It's impossible because everyone understands that the, the electricity that you consume, this light bulb here is, is always gonna be the closest uh, available uh, electricity. So there's a system called guarantees of origin um, being a business consumer company, of course, these questions never really arise if you're in the industry and you're talking about production. But for, for us, this is this is, this is important. Um, so you consume electricity. Uh, afterwards, we look at how much you consumed over that month, and we acquire on behalf of your household the equivalent uh, quantities of, of, of uh, guarantees of origin, as they're called. This has been going on for a long time. This is greenwashing in its in its finest form, if you like. Um, because it's what every 
a hundred percent renewable energy supplier has been doing forever. Um, and it's a flawed tool, as you as as I'm saying here, but it's the tool that's available, and we decided to use that tool, but to challenge it as much as we can, um, and and also add a couple of twists to make it more worthwhile. So so we set up a company, electricity supplier company, um, like you probably have a handful selling 100% uh, solar or 100% wind in your in your neighborhood right now, um, but doing it with nuclear energy uh, guarantees of origin instead. And of course, all the services associated with selling electricity uh, as well. Um, as I said, we're coming from outside, which is, you know, I, I enjoy David's presentation very much uh, because I think a lot of what he's talking about is stuff that we at least hope to have been inspired by coming from outside this industry and coming from outside the world of nuclear energy. We wanted to create something that's more along the lines of the, the user experience that you want. Um, so we're trying to do it from an end user perspective as much as possible. So the UX is important. I'll come back to that soon. And also we realized that we wanted to be part, or we didn't even know at the time when we started the company that there already was a very big pro-nuclear advocacy around the world and in Sweden, but uh, it was great to see and we could team up with all of those guys. We set up to create this hashtag, Rationel Milieuven, Rational Environmentalist, or as it's now called, Eco-Rational um, in the UK or in the US um, setting, if you like. But that was something that we wanted to kind of gather people in this movement and teaming up with advocates and providing a way for people that believe that nuclear energy has a big role to play in the future to actually um, select nuclear energy for their own uh, businesses and households. And then we realized in Sweden, if we were going to carry this home, we needed to um, tell people the facts because facts are very often hidden away and boring graphs, etc. So we so we sat down and created these logics of nuclear, as they're called, um, infographics available as coffee table books, available as you know Instagram posts or blogs or whatever, uh, where we explain emissions, uh, nuclear waste recycling. Um, uh, capacity factors uh, um, and and um, security, etc. So we created some nice graphics, and and uh, we wanted to be able to show people that nuclear is not only good; it's actually the best. But the important thing is that we're not going to use coal or gas, for example, to wind, hydro, nuclear, solar, geothermal. The new exciting one <laughs> is, is all going to be part of the good winning side here. So. Uh, but we're on the we're on the nuclear side, and we wanted to actually see. So we tested a lot of different things, and we're still doing that, by the way. Um, so we're doing unexpected things. So instead of kind of hiding away the fact that we're selling nuclear energy, of course, we built the brand around nuclear energy, and we also wanted to empower the local um, uh, communities that have uh, nuclear power stations. So we made it possible when you sign up for us to select if you want to to support the your local nuclear power plants. Being that we acquire your 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 part of the guarantees of origin from that specific power plant, and then of course we use that data to rate which is the most popular nuclear power plant each month. And we have this competition throughout the year, which coming to December will tell um, uh, which which of all the three uh, Swedish nuclear power plants is the most popular. Um, and and then uh, you know like like you know all fun and games, but really trying to empower people um, that are doing such a good service to your environment. And, and 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 also, you know, we have a web shop where we're selling merchandise. So, T-shirts with these icons that we made for each of these uh, these um, uh, nuclear power plants were available. So now they're all sold out. Um, and we're also, you know, we're doing a lot of merchandise. We're also trying to work with different uh, cooperations with different companies and photographers, etc., and trying to break out of that kind of boring segment um, world and do more. Uh, fun things. We're trying and testing everything. I mean, this is a fully owned company, mm, you know, now very, uh, you know, it's a profitable company. Uh, we're lucky to say um, already after a year into this and, and we're happy that we can try and test and test new things every day um, in that sense. So I don't know how much time I have, but uh, basically we pushed out a press release that was picked up like crazy. So the press release uh, headline was, now you can power your life with 100% nuclear. Um, in August of last year, and uh, um, it generated uh, in Sweden again. I mean, it was up to 2,500, I think, signups total um, out of the blue. We had, a, you know, 9,000 views on our press release, which in average is about 400 when you're an unknown company. 
we integrated with the digital ID scheme called Bank ID in Sweden, which meant that you could onboard really quickly and really securely to our service, which was the first company to do that in Sweden. So kind of nuclear power is what we're selling, but we also try to make it more innovative in, in, in how we approach the, the market and try to push the boundaries a little bit there. One easy tariff, you know, don't, there's not different campaigns or you get this price or, or, or she gets that price. This is, this is like the Spotify model. We have a tariff. You, 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 you can only have that one. Um, and that's really, you know, and full transparency is also really important. We noticed this industry is full of people trying to hide different costs and, and stuff in different brackets and it's really shitty. So we're trying to be as, as transparent as possible with our pricing. No subscription period. You can leave at any time. You stay because you want to stay, not because you have to stay. And, and then we try to pride ourselves with some really high uh, quality uh, customer support, which has worked well. And then you can see Eric Ingersoll and, and Christy Gogan being on this panel. Um, we were so proud and happy for, to have them join our, our advisory board together with uh, rock star Jose Gonzalez, um, hit music producer Johan Carlson, um, author, professor Stephen Pink. Um, and uh, Christian Eckberg, professor from here in Gothenburg, working with uh, nuclear waste management, as well as the Karl-Heinz Landebjörg, uh, who is also very, very uh, uh, pr prominent in, in the field of nuclear waste um, uh, management uh, from Chalmers University. And then, of course, Caroline Cochran, uh, COO of uh, OCLO. We put together this nice panel of, of people that can help, uh, you know, prove our value and help us um, push the boundaries a little bit more. And we want to be on politicals in everything we do. We have nothing to do with politics. Politics sucks. Um, so we, we try to stay away from that. Um, we give back the science for every kilowatt hour that people consume of nuclear energy from harmful wheat set aside a sum of money that we put into a pot. First year, it's not going to be massive. It might cover, you know, a scholarship or something for someone. But over the years, this could become a very important contribution towards science, I think. And I think our advisory board will help us also work with that. How much do I have, Eric? Is it one minute? Is it five minutes? Is it over? I'll just keep on. All right. <laughs> All right. There's only a few more slides. Um, but basically, this is an, a very important part of why people select us as well over other um, companies is that we give back um, to science very actively and you get to pick a winner in, in, in December as well um, out of, you know, three candidates, et cetera. So incredible traction and it's all organic. And that's been, you know, the, the, the makings of this. I think David had a really nice uh, um, article around us uh, this past uh, weekend um, focusing on this part because it's growing so quickly and it's really going word of mouth style. We can see down on a street level, you know, neighbor selects us as their electricity provider, buys the, the stickers, you know, puts them on the mailbox and then the next neighbor and then the next neighbor. It's really catching on around Sweden. And, and it was a big survey um, done by Vattenfall uh, uh, two weeks back that proved that, that now nuclear power is the second most popular uh, form of electricity electricity to, 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 you know, select as, uh, as a household in Sweden. Solar power, well, they don't even know that it's from Italy most of the time, the guarantees of origin in Sweden, which is confusing, is by far the most popular. But then, you know, even more popular than wind power and, and hydro, nuclear power is now the second. And, you know, imagine a year ago, there wasn't even a company selling it explicitly. So something's happened. We have about 20 some uh, followers now, copycat companies. Well, there's like four or five copy cat companies, and then, you know, 15 some that have added an electricity tariff to their offering, which is great because that drives the need and the availability of nuclear power as a whole, which is the most important part of this, right? We're very happy to have taken on this position where we could use our social media to reach a lot of people and, and, and you know, really tell the story and be here with you. And coming back to what David was saying before, you know, how can we change the look and feel of, 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 of nuclear power? We're trying to do that. I mean, these are in Swedish, but we're always talking about the long sight, you know, <laughs> the clean nature and, and really being clear about 100% nuclear in all our communication. These are some of the ads, you know, untouched nature, um, you know, far seen, um, stable grids, etc. But it turns out, I mean, we crack with this company and this is something to inspire people everywhere that, that, you know, may want to set up a similar company or work with us in your country because that's something that's going to happen as well now with Carnival is that we've got very low churn. We've got very low 
customer acquisition costs. So people don't leave and we don't need to buy them, which is very popular in, in this industry. You give them 500 crowns, of, you know, vouchers to buy something or you, you that's how you purchase customers as an electricity um, supplier. I mean, people select us because of who we are and the organic growth and, and, and uh, what we what we stand for. Um, and then, of course, people have very high referral rates, which is very good as well. So, so we're able to build a very, you know, profitable company um, by by just being, you know, true and honest and trying to trying to really do the right thing um, in every aspect and not shying away from the fact that nuclear power is awesome. Um, and, you know, so those are the success factors. We have a small, dedicated team. We're good at what we do. We're independent and fully owned still, um, and and that's important to us. When we were first to market, you know, we have a very different take and an offer, and we're trying to do things and trying to surprise the market all the time, um, and trying to be factual, transparent, and honest about what we do, and trying to, you know, it's a company for this 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050 uh, kind of generation that really want facts and and have had enough of greenwashing and all of the uh, the, the, the the above. Um, so we, we want to ride with that. Hopefully the guarantees of origin system will be upgraded. We're pushing that, try to make it more explicitly associated with actual uh, uh, production and consumption taking place at least in the same area, like Nord Pool in Sweden, or, and then, you know, trying to associate it in time, et cetera. And we're now we're growing this moment outside of Sweden. So uh, you need to stay tuned. Um, and if you're intrigued or, have ideas or, or thoughts, you know, um, just reach out. We are, you know, <laughs> putting the putting the benchmark pretty high, but we believe that Carnival could be for nuclear energy, what Spotify was for music, We, you know, making it accessible, making it affordable, making it uh, cool and, and easy to, to, to use. And, uh, you know, uh, nuclear energy is, is, has so many things going for it. And I didn't even know, you know, properly before we got going. But it's just dawning on me every day, desalination or, you know, hydrogen or, you know, all of these incredibly exciting stuff that we can, that, that, that can come from this beautiful uh, atomic um, swing, if you like. So I think that's it. Um, thank you so much for listening to my rambling. Um, you have my Twitters and my, and my email address there. Just uh, ping me or reach out if you want to know anything else. Um, you know, yeah. Thank you. Man. Thanks so much, John. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, I just want to, before we move on, check the scoreboard real quick here. Let's see how we're doing. Oh, oh great. Oh, oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one I'm selling. That's the one I'm selling. 38 now. <laughs> and, All right. And you, and you said that nuclear is almost like two grams per kilowatt hour in Sweden. Why? Two and a half. Yeah. So if you go up here to nuclear, you can see that it's, it's being measured at the IPCC report, which is 12 grams. Mm -hmm. You see there, yeah. um, but but I've talked to Oliver uh, Karate and the people at, at Tomorrow um, about how we can make it locally because in oh, the UK it's about five grams in the UK and then France it's three grams and and uh, you know Germany is, is three or four grams as well for the little they have left and Sweden is about two and a half now so it's really about the life cycle of course but that's it's also um, since the energy use by nuclear is is largely electric, you know. In other words, the component, the processing of the fuel and all that stuff. If you're doing that in a very clean grid, you obviously don't have a lot of emissions. So, right. so en enrichment of the fuel, yes, so, so. kind of thing. Yeah, it's enrichment of the fuel. It's also the, the outages because obviously when a plant isn't running. Uh, during an outage when it's shut down for maintenance and refueling, you're still consuming a lot of electricity. And if you're in a grid where the electricity is dirty, then that raises your life cycle emissions effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, again, back to the world that we're in, where people in Sweden, most of them want to select 100% solar power, but the solar power guarantees of origin are acquired from the Italian market. Instead. And you can see, you know, it's it's a crazy greenwashing world that needs to be fixed uh, because otherwise you know we can do a lot of things on the inside business to business but if the business consumer world is still allowing people to try to power their lives in sweden with you know three-year-old guarantees of origin from italy then we have a problem so yeah, it's, and, uh, that's why that's why this electricity map is, is so pivotal and and the stuff that google is doing now 
where they're saying enough, we're going to tie ourselves up to the APIs from electricity map and make sure that our production takes place on clean grids in real time. That's the most important move that that can happen, I think, on this market. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think, I don't know to what extent everyone in the audience understands this, but it the the ability to make a market for the product is it's really critical. And so the, the initial thinking around guarantees of origin and so forth was really necessary to make people able to vote when utilities didn't want to change the power that they were producing. But this these flaws that you're pointing out, which basically don't link it to the time that it's produced and don't link it to the kind of reasonable market uh, geography where it's produced, uh, limit the usefulness of that, um, that approach. And, uh, so could you, I mean, we talked about this, John, when we visited you in Sweden, could you, could you just say like, how, how's the progress going? How's it going on that? I mean, are they, is there, is there a lot of resistance to making this kind of clarification in the underlying mechanism, or is it just, a, is it just that you guys have been busy and, making the nice website or something instead. <laughs> no, we're pushing like crazy to get, but th that, that needs to happen on a higher level than we're at. But by pointing out the flaws, we're actually putting pressure on the market to improve the way that it works, right? So, and we're also, um, you know, uh, working with companies that are involved in tech technologies, you know, be blockchain or, or that could associate in real-time production and consumption, et cetera. So I think this is the... This is the driver of electricity map in tomorrow, and we're very, very much on board with, with what they want to accomplish. We're a seller of you know nuclear energy, but um, real time and clean that's, energy. Exactly. I mean, we're at least when we're selling it in Sweden. You know, I live close to Ring House. I my energy is you know from nuclear power, so it's 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 about. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that people start to understand that. And that's a longer conversation, but I think so. I think, you know, see the likes of Greta Thunberg lifting that in her big speech about how greenwashing needs to stop. We can't make way with all these paper shenanigans and, and you know, accounting and creative stuff. It needs to happen in real time. And that's exactly the point. But if that happens in real time, then nuclear power is absolutely pivotal. And that's what we're that's 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 the reason why we built up a company circling around that fact because we understand where the trajectory is going and people again are going to be more appreciative of facts than fiction if you like or emotions uh, the way we're heading you'd hope so <laughs> no but i'm sure we need, there's no other choice <laughs> oh you're so rational in sweden <laughs> <laughs> so eco-rational <laughs> Do you have a question? Is Carnival looking to replicate its model in other countries? Yes, we are, Jeremy. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I can't disclose which countries, but uh, that's happening in, in not too not not too long. Um, and and of course, we want to do it everywhere. We'd like to see Carnival International like in an umbrella brand for every rational thinking people in the world to have 100% nuclear by Carnival. That would be the ideal situation, and that's what we're pushing for. So, but we need to find people and you know, ways to do it in every market, but we're all ears and, and we're, all, we're right here. I had a quick uh, question as we're uh, on, on this section still, uh, and that's how much more would it cost to do 100% nuclear versus uh, let's say 100% uh, clean? So you got, you know, the mix of hydro and that mostly in Sweden. Well, I mean, I mean, we've always said, so for starters, there's, there's no extra cost. In Sweden, uh, we, the, the price of electricity, regardless of the origin, is about the same. Um, there's no premium to use nuclear energy or, or, or wind or solar. That's the problem, by the way, with, with, with those that are more scarce. Um, I mean, it's really, really ridiculously small compared to all the subsidies and stuff that we're paying. So, but, uh, you know, we have no issue pivoting and adding, I mean, we're big fans of, of, of Stefan Christ and Joshua Goldstein's renewables approach, right? Nuclear plus renewables. We'd love to have a tariff like that, but we're not going to put the tariff like that into our mix unless nuclear is at a stage where it's accepted and on competing on level ground. That's what we're trying to do with our company, right? And, and once, because in Sweden, it's completely, you know, like this and nuclear needs all the help it can get to come back up with the scale. So, so, but, but, you know, would it be cheaper? It's, 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 the electricity prices are the same. 
um, at, at, at the level we're at, you know? So we're following the spot price of node pool. So when the wind is out, the prices go down and our prices go down as well. And, uh, you know, so it, 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 we're following that circus. Um, we'd like to see the prices be more stable, which is something that we can accommodate by having more hydro and more nuclear power instead of stuff that follows the weather. But, but um, you know, who are we to? <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder, uh, of course, in the U.S., we have all of this uh, absurdly cheap methane gas, um, thanks to fracking. <laughs> um, so I wonder yeah, but I mean, we benefit from that. If you had methane gas here that would be so cheap, then, then you know, our tariff would benefit from it because we're buying the electricity from the same stock exchange. All of the, the Nordic region does. So, so all the electricity produced in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, the Baltics are be, is being sold on one stock exchange, like one 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 platform in Oslo in Norway, and that becomes a spot price that is different from each uh, uh, I don't know the, the the zones that you're that you're that you're living in, hmm. and those prices are not down to what the actual production is uh, specifically, but but of course it impacts. So if there's a really cheap way of producing electricity, which you know Swedish nuclear. I think it's like 18 or oh, whatever, it's like nothing um, to produce mm -hmm. nuclear energy. Um, then, then, then that of course makes our prices so low and we have very, very low prices in Sweden. So, you know, we're, we're living proof that you should really try to have as much nuclear power as you can hmm. or hydro if you're lucky enough. <laughs> yeah, it must, must be nice having all those <laughs> hills and <laughs> yards and mountains. Uh, <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, John. I uh, appreciate it. I'm, I'm sure we'll have some more uh, questions uh, after in, in our Q&A part here. Um, yeah, I think uh, now uh, we'll, we'll move on to our next uh, panelists, uh, Kirsty and Eric. Uh, very excited uh, to, to hear from you both again uh, ever since, let's see, what was it back er early January? It was pre-pandemic, I think. When, uh, when we last saw each other and uh, you were telling me about this new project you had with uh, a hydrogen gigafactory and floating nuclear desalination islands. And uh, so very excited to hear about that. Um, and so it's all yours. Thanks, thanks so much, Eric. Yeah, wow. Um, and here we are in, you know, the kind of, um, almost a year later, right? Uh, it's take, taken us a while. So this, this, this report, has been uh, yeah a year in the making um, or more really but let's call it a year um, and it was really a labor of love it was really um, a project that um, that Eric and I just you know sort of really felt was needed in the world and so um, we pulled in you know our our team and many of our colleagues and we did a huge amount of peer review and uh, yeah, we're incredibly excited to share it with you now. So we just published it in September. We had some pretty good coverage. It was on the front page of the Sunday Times uh, business section and in you know environmental trade uh, press and so on. Um, and you know, hopefully it's just the beginning really of the conversation. Um, so you can see here, it's called Missing Link to a Livable Climate, how hydrogen enables synthetic fuels can deliver the Paris goals. And if you're eagle-eyed, you'll notice that We've got a little sort of subheading down here, which is the 30 years to 2050. And really that sets the frame, I think, for everything that we want to talk about today, which is that we have an unbelievably short timescale within which to make a unprecedented shift in our energy system, not just in the power sector, but beyond. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on mostly here. So let me just see if I can skip to the next slide here. So is everyone able to see the heading on the slide okay? Great. So I'm just going to talk through the deck and then I'm going to invite Eric to jump in and interrupt me and add, add detail or speak to whichever slides you want. So you're kind of going to get a double act here um, between Eric and I. And actually, I should sort of step back a moment and say that for those of you that don't know us, um, Lucid Catalyst is uh, the consulting firm that Eric and I co-founded. And um, we are, um, you know, sort of experts in designing very scalable strategies um, for, uh, for uh, very, uh, well, let's call it climate scale solutions um, that are cost competitive, extremely scalable, um, and can be rapidly deployed. 
Um, and we tend to focus quite a lot on nuclear technology, partly because it's very neglected. So there's a lot of um, opportunities for cost reduction and improving um, rates of deployment. Um, and partly because we see tremendous potential, particularly for this technology to reach other parts of the decarbonization challenge um, that other energy technologies can't really reach. And here are some of those, um, those sectors that are hard to reach. Um, almost all the mainstream um, energy systems projections um, show that we'll be using that more than 50% of our energy is going to come from fossil fuels by 2050. Here you can see the um, International Energy Agency's stated policy scenario, which actually shows almost more than 70% of our energy coming from fossil fuels by 2050. And um, the, the the kind of spoiler alert is that most of that is oil um, for transport, for heavy transport uses and other uses, as well as uh, gas for non-electricity uses. So those are the, those, those liquid fuel sectors are really, you know, really big challenges um, in our decarbonisation efforts. Um, many of you will be familiar with this slide. Um, is this is from the IPCC report, really showing you know how much we have to do within a very short time period. Um, we've made a little to-do list here, um, uh, you know, uh, to sort of describe some of those um, challenges uh, that we have to meet, like, for example, repowering all of our coal plants with a new heat source. Um, I, I find it very shocking that the um, world's coal fleet is actually getting younger. Um, so although we're celebrating closing old coal in Europe and in the United States, in fact, a lot of new coal is being built around the world today. It, re it represents prosperity. It represents, you know, socioeconomic benefits to people and communities, um, particularly in developing world countries where they really need the um, energy to support their development. And the question is, what will happen to those assets? It's very unlikely that they're just going to be abandoned, partly because of the benefits that they represent, but also because um, they, there's a lot of associated infrastructure that's been built to enable the, those coal plants, and including, of course, transmission. So really the question we should be asking is how do we repurpose those assets? How do we repurpose that infrastructure? And you know, we may, for example, use um, clean heat sources such as advanced reactors or even geothermal. Um, as, as a potential new heat source for those plants. We also need to convert all liquid fuels to carbon neutral fuels, replace natural gas use with clean alternatives. Hydrogen, of course, um, is, an, is a critical piece of that, whether it's used as an end use fuel or as a feedstock for the production of clean synthetic fuels like ammonia. Um, we also need to take into account that the vast majority of people in the world today lack access to enough electricity and therefore we really need to be building in a lot of growth to our climate mitigation strategies and that's that's really sort of a profound principle by which we um, plan all of our strategies um, uh, uh, as, as you will see and then of course yes we have to electrify as much as possible so not only do we need to you know replace all of our fossil fuel infrastructure um, but probably double or even triple um, that capacity as well really really fast so lots to do within a very short period of time. Um, Eric, do you want to speak to this uh, Impossible Burger slide or should I keep going? You're muted. Go ahead. Oh, OK. So, well, we, we like to use this analogy of the Impossible Burger, um, which, if you don't know, is a plant based uh, substitute for meat. Um, and you can buy Impossible Burgers in Burger Kings all over the United States. Uh, looks like a burger, tastes like a burger, costs the same as a burger. You can buy it through the existing supply chains. And that's what really all of our climate solutions need to need to be like. They, they, they can't depend on people being willing to uh, change their behavior for ethical or environmental reasons. Um, they can't cost more and they need to be ideally available using existing infrastructure. So that's that's our sort of theory of change. We need drop in cost competitive substitutes for the um, for the unhealthy alternatives uh, that we that we depend on today. Um, uh -huh. Okay, so let's look at the fuels decarbonation de decarbonization challenge. Um, so oil use alone is a hundred million barrels of oil per day. So it's really difficult for humans to get their heads around the scale of the challenge. And you know when we started looking at um, uh, outside of the power sector, you know, really sort of brought home to us the fact that 
um, you know, the power sector is actually only 20% of our energy consumption and around a quarter of our mission, our emissions. So what about the other, you know, 75 or 80%? Um, and interestingly, over the last 20 years or so, you know, we really haven't seen much attention in the climate and energy discourse paid to those other sectors. And it's partly because they're really difficult. It's partly because we just don't have cost competitive, credible pathways to decarbonize those sectors, which is why you end up seeing forecasts like this, which is why you end up, you know, with the assumption that we're really not going to be able to get there, that we're not going to decarbonize those sectors. Um, so what's it going to take to, to develop impossible burgers for those fossil fuels that we use in aviation and shipping and transport and, and, and industry? Well, if we were to use hydrogen, clean, cleanly produced hydrogen without emissions to make ammonia as a drop-in substitute cost competitive fuel in shipping, for example, then that, that hydrogen would need to cost a less than $1.10 per kilogram. And you can see this, here's the pink line going diagonally up the chart there. And the range that you see in those two bands so it's showing high oil prices and low oil prices you know, your, your ammonia um, from your hydrogen to produce ammonia production cost needs to sit ideally towards the low oil prices band. So really that's, a, you can see that uh, that's around about a dollar per kilogram of hydrogen. That doesn't sound, you know, that sounds Kirsty, useful, right? Kirsty, can I just yeah. say, sure. make, a, make a key point here, which is that yeah. it, if we look at this in combination with the previous slide, what, what it tells us is that to replace something that big and, and to replace it in the time that we have, we're going to need a very cost competitive substitute. So just having a substitute isn't enough. It has to be a substitute that is either cheaper or is at least this not more than the same price so that the the friction of making the changes that are necessary is as low as possible. Because one of the reasons that, that we've made progress replacing, uh, you know, with renewables in electricity markets is that there's been heavy subsidies and, and very heavy sort of thumb on the scale to sort of push those renewables onto the grid. You know, that may have been necessary to do that. But when you think about doing that across a entire global economy, um, it's, it's not clear that you can really use subsidies in the same way because, this, uh, because of the scale that would be necessary. So this is really telling us where you have to be in terms of making your primary ingredient, which is hydrogen, in order to make cost competitive substitutes that will be, which, which will enable rapid substitution. Great. Okay. So, um, redeploying oil and gas capability for clean hydrogen and sin fuels production. So now we're going into the part where we describe to you how we can make hydrogen that cheap. So here's the first concept, uh, the refinery scale hydrogen or, and sin fuels gigafactory. Hey, Eric, do you want to do this one too? Sure. So this is a uh, 25 gigawatt thermal um, high temperature uh, uh, reactor farm with, and in the upper left, you see uh, two factories. You see on the, on the, on the left-hand side, you see a, a flat low building, which is the precast factory. And that's making all the precast concrete components, which you can see being moved on the crane out to the reactor farm and being placed in. And then the, the, uh, the manufacturing, the big manufacturing facility on the right at the top is where the reactor and heat exchanger components are made in a highly automated uh, assembly line fashion and where the pre-packaging and sort of uh, final assembly of, of racks of equipment that are also gonna be placed into the reactor farm are, are, are put together. And the, the cranes which stay there th throughout the life of the project enable um, kind of an assembly line process to go from the factories all the way out to the final installation and the completion of that. Those are, the reactor farm is connected to the chemical processing plant um, via uh, molten salt uh, pipes, pipes that carry molten salt for heat transport. There's a hydrogen uh, section, which is in the sort of middle there. And then there's, um, in the lower right, there's a uh, ammonia plant that is making 
uh, ammonia from the hydrogen. And so this is uh, pictured, uh, actually it's sort of meant to be in the UK and it's meant to be on an abandoned um, or a disused refinery site, coastal refinery site. And about um, 12 of these would replace current UK oil consumption. Great, thank you. And so I'll just add a couple of uh, it, sort of observations, which is one thing I love about this um, uh, move um, in terms of application for nuclear technology from utilities, sort of electricity production to commodities, fuels production, is that it really liberates um, the developer um, in terms of the scale and the location of sites. So traditionally, when you're sort of selling, you know, product to make electricity for the grid, you're constrained by the demand, first of all, of course, from your electricity system and also um, access to transmission. If you, if you don't need either of those things, if you're actually making commodities that you can store and transport and even export to global markets, then you can locate wherever is convenient to you, but you can also really scale up your facility and you can afford then to invest in building a really, you know, extremely good factory to make your equipment. So you can build, you know, you can install uh, multiple multiple heat sources into your site. So this is a very, very different business model, a very different investor proposition, and a really different sort of, you know, opportunity, market opportunity for advanced reactor developers. So Kirsty, can I just say one, one more oh, thing sure. about that? Mm -hmm. So the, the, if you read up in the kind of advanced reactor, gen four reactor space, a lot of people have the idea that it would be better if we could manufacture these things in a high volume manufacturing uh, approach. The problem is that to make those investments, you, you either need to be very, very, very wealthy, or you need to have a, a well-defined order book for your product. Okay. So the, 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 the reactor okay. factory presupposes that somebody has committed to buying a whole bunch of your um, reactors. This is a way around that problem. Great. So this solves the chicken and egg problem for manufacturing advanced reactors. Yeah. And so, Eric, you've made a, a great insight, which is, you know, to drive down costs from um, building nuclear plants, you either need to bring your project to the factory or your factory to the project. We just saw, you know, the example where we bring the factory to the project. This is the other example where you actually bring your project to the factory. In this case, the factory is a shipyard and you can see here shipyard construction of a floating production platform, which we're going to show you in a moment. The reason that we really like shipyards is that they are probably the highest manufacturing, manuf highest productivity manufacturing environments in the world. They make extremely large, extremely complex, extremely highly regulated machines that are very well understood by the oil and gas sectors. And so this is, these are the ingredients for a opportunity for transition in the oil and gas sector to the production of clean liquid with fuels. And here it is in action. Here's this is a ammonia um, bunker offloading ammonia from a production platform that's being made in an offshore deployment um, uh, uh, scenario. Um, this is a really large ship, I should add, you know, this, this is what is it like a quarter of a kilometer long? Um, no, three, 300. It's, it's almost 400 meters. So it's, it's, it's like almost a half a kilometer. Oh. Almost a half a kilometer long. So it's important just to give you a little bit of a sense of scale um, of what this is. And this is, you know, the same kind of configuration that you saw a moment ago in the hydrogen gigafactory, except it's it's in a it's in a ship. Um, here's another example of of this um, this kind of deployment. This is really intended for developing world um, markets, um, and it's a multi-product platform. So again, you have high temperature reactors. Producing, um, producing power that's cabled into shore as well as hydrogen, which can be used for the production of synthetic fuels. And one of the things I love about this platform is that it's also using the waste heat for um, desalination, producing enough fresh water um, for the city region of Accra. So, you know, all you have to do is add in the kind of, um, you know, the, the produ uh, protein production and you've got, you know, you, you've got many of the sustainable development goals met just on this, on this uh, nice little platform that can also be, you know, moved if necessary, um, which, you know, is an important feature in developing world economies for, um, uh, for raising investment for these kind of long- And just long a couple, a couple sort of costs. notes about the costs here. Um, the, the 
ammonia ship is producing ammonia, which is a few finished, would be in this case a finished fuel for somewhere between 60 and $70 a barrel. So usually fuels are more expensive than crude. And um, so that's well below the, the 10 year average price for ship fuel, for example. And we have, uh, we, the, the hydrogen gigafactory is able to produce very large amounts of hydrogen for slightly less than a dollar a kilogram, which is, um, would be competitive, you know, on a, just on a heat val heating value price would be, heating value basis would be competitive with um, uh, the, the price of natural gas in the UK. So without I'll just, considering carbon emissions at all. Yeah, so remember this chart where we showed you what the kind of target prices are for hydrogen production for ammonia, um, but also for synthetic hydrocarbons. And we've added in here um, a couple of options for the potential cost of carbon that you might need if you're making synthetic hydrocarbons for aviation fuel, for example, um, in which case your hydrogen needs to be even cheaper, like it needs to be less than a dollar a kilogram. This, this chart shows these kinds of cost outcomes um, that Eric was just describing, um, either from the shipyard built plant or the hydrogen gigafactory. Both of these um, you know, could within the sort of 2030 timeframe um, be producing hydrogen um, at that less than a dollar target price. Um, and you'll notice that there aren't any other Techno clean technology options coming anywhere near to that kind of price. And a big part of the reason for that is because of the, firstly, the high capacity factor for nuclear technologies, but also critically the, the ability to make high temperature heat and then combine that with a very small environmental footprint. And you end up with actually a very, very compelling value proposition to achieve the kinds of scale that's needed to really you know, start taking on the, the scale of oil and gas and those 100 million barrels of oil per day kind of scale that we, that we actually need to achieve for the, for the full clean energy transition within mid-century time scales. I wasn't gonna spend much more time on this chart now unless Eric, you wanted to add nope. any, any further okay. details. It's all available in our beautiful report. Um, this is a chart from the report showing the kind of fuel substance Institution that would be achievable in those difficult to decarbonize sectors from that ultra cheap hydrogen generated by advanced heat sources within that critical 30 year window that we really that we have. One thing to say actually about the other clean technology options for hydrogen production is that, you know, no one sees any like realistic possibility of renewables achieving those very, very low cost outcomes for hydrogen production before 2050. And, you know, there's a real question about what are we going to do in the meantime? You know, so Considering yeah, great. that we have okay. to be done with decarbonization by then. Exactly. So time, timeliness is really critical here. And none of the technologies that we're showing you today are, you know, that far out in terms of being ready to commercialize. Really the innovation that you're seeing here is much less in the technology, the reactor technology and much more in the technology configurations and in the deployment models and in the delivery models um, moving to really high productivity manufacturing. If we were to apply those techniques that, you're, that we're describing here to you, for you today to completely replace those 100 million barrels of oil with clean fuels by 2050, then this would represent a, a lower investment than would otherwise be required to maintain that existing flow of oil in those 30 years. The oil and gas industry is expecting to spend $24 trillion just to sustain that existing flow of oil. And that's before we take into account, you know, rising global energy demand or anything else. That's what they're expecting to spend. And our estimates suggest that, that by doing it, that the, the other way through clean production would only cost 18 trillion. As my nine-year-old put it beautifully, he said, you mean it's cheaper to save the world than to destroy it? <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, there's your impossible burger. Um, here's the number of ships that would be needed. There's currently 60,000. No, there's currently how many there's ships? There's currently 60,000 sort of medium and large uh, mm -hmm. vessels. In the world, we need around 16, 15,000 ships in total to deliver that scale of current oil use today. And we, and we could do it all with around 70 shipyards. 
There's currently 280 shipyards operating in the world today, medium and large size, um, running at about 50% capacity. There's already, you know, just even with the existing shipyard capability and capacity in the world today, we could really get started. Demonstrating that business case, you know, we see huge potential to, to restore, to regenerate, to upgrade shipyards in Europe and in the United States to start churning out these, these production platforms um, uh, and, you know, and delivering clean fuel around the world. Just before we finish, um, there's one more constraint. So we've talked about investment. We've talked about skills and capability constraints. We've talked about, um, about time constraints, rates of deployment. We've talked about cost constraints. And you know, we think we can, we can tackle many of those. There's one more, which is space. The land or the area actually required to replace that, that current flow of oil and, and gas. So here's a thought experiment where we show you um, what it would take in terms of land area or sea area to replace um, a few different countries' entire oil consumption with these different uh, production options. If they were dedicated to hydrogen production. So here's the map showing um, an offshore wind area required for a full offshore wind farm dedicated to hydrogen production off the coast of the UK or solar um, in yellow dedicated to hydrogen production. And I, can anyone see the green there, which is the, it's like, um, where's Wally? Um, we have to put a big arrow pointing at the nuclear um, footprint because it's it's shockingly small because of course you'll all know that the the power density of nuclear energy is 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 just unparalleled and um, if i could just say oh, one, one more thing please. about the power density so this is this is really looking at at amount of hydrogen produced per square kilometer so this is more than just power density this is actually produced energy density and so you may have 50, 50 megawatts per square kilometer power density for solar, but if you, if in the UK you have an 11% capacity factor, you don't get that much energy out of that square kilometer um, per year. And uh, so this is a combination of the, the benefits of nuclear having extremely high power density and also very high capacity factors for that footprint. I keep going, Eric. So this is the same analysis for Japan. Um, as you guys know, Japan is very mountainous. You couldn't really cover all that much of Japan with, with PV. And uh, the, oath, the, the sea there is a little bit deep for, for, um, for offshore wind. And also China probably would have some thoughts about using it for that. But again, we were able to cite, uh, we were able to cite a, a small uh, artificial island like the uh, Osaka airport um, with, with sort of slots for the ships to kind of come in to. And we were able to cite that in one of the inland um, bays in Japan. Uh, so, you know, very, very feasible to actually do this. And then this is the story about Korea. Again, Korea, um, that's the solar is covering, you know, probably, 60% of South Korea there, um, which again is very mountainous and has very little flat space. So you can't really use flat space for doing this. And again, this is a highly contested marine area. So you wouldn't, it's not very li likely that you could uh, use all of it for, for one country's huge wind farm to make hydrogen. And again, we were able to make uh, a kind of a, a relatively compact, a uh, little nuclear hydrogen factory um, in one of the bays in, in the south. And uh, so this shows that kind of really feasible from a cost perspective, really feasible from a land use perspective. Great. And, and that's it. Given the scale and urgency that, you know, we really need to look at all the zero carbon hydrogen production options. And what we found the reason we were really motivated to do this study and to do this work is that we, we found that there was a huge um, appetite um, and interest in hydrogen as a decarbonization tool. And we didn't really feel that nuclear energy was being very well represented in that discussion as a very kind of very promising but, but, um, but option. I, I, think, I think it's also important to say that that's very understandable. 
there, you know, you can see why the oil and gas industry doesn't want to build a bunch of Hinkleys or Vogels to solve their hydrogen problem, right? The, the nuclear industry has basically a completely broken project delivery model and cannot deliver in the, in the developing world, in the developed world, is having a very difficult time delivering projects in a way that's economically realistic and so forth. And those costs, even the costs of effectively delivered projects like, you know, $4,000 a kilowatt and stuff is still too expensive for making hydrogen for the kind of applications that we're talking about. So this is not, oh, like, this is a cool thing to think about or, or something. This is really, we have to radically innovate the, the delivery models in order to get down to costs that are sort of on the order of $1,000 a kilowatt for the heat, the heat source and the power generation components. As you can see here, and we, you can read more about that in our, our beautiful report. So I will thank you very much, Eric, for inviting us. No, that was fantastic. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the, the hope uh, <laughs> that uh, you brought <laughs> forth is just palpable. So thank you for that. Uh, we actually have a shot. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, That's the here. <laughs> thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask. I Go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure. If I, I, I missed. I missed this. But you know, the sort of the lower end of the price point for hydrogen um, that you were aiming at for this gigafactory. Will that then be competitive? Do you think with fossil fuel sourced, um, you know, petrol, diesel that we use today, or does it? Will it require some sort of carbon tax no. in order to that? No, no, no. no. The, the our our theory is that. I mean, you can do, you could probably do carbon taxes in Europe and you could probably do carbon taxes in, in some countries. The cross-border issues are gonna be really difficult mm -hmm. and large amounts of the world are not gonna ever do a carbon tax. Right. So if, if you're thinking about this as a global problem, you know, the, having a sort of crutch that you're gonna figure out some way to price the externalities in and all that stuff, I just really don't think that it's not scalable. It's it's a it's it's a kind of a nice thing to talk about with your economics professor or something, but it's really not scalable, and and we need this to happen very very quickly. So, um, it, you know, we can't wait until a carbon tax is you know till everybody agrees to have a carbon tax. That that could take till twenty forty, right. right? So let's. So our, our, you know, and that's not to say that people shouldn't work on good policies and all that. That's fine. They should do that. We, we want to get started uh, making stuff happen. And the other kind of big insight that we had was that not only do people sort of not really think that much about the fuels business, but basically everybody just hates on the oil companies all the time, right? And we, you know, th those oil companies are the ones that are, putting trillions of dollars to work every year, building our the energy supply that we currently use. Even if we would prefer that they gave us something else, it, they're still delivering that. And that's a, you know, that's not just some competence that you can go, you know, down the street and pick up, right? The ability to deliver big projects and make them work and make them work in hostile environments and, you know, all of that and deliver the energy products all over the world, that's, that is the sort of state of the art of the energy industry today. So what we're doing is, you know, we really want to get the, the, we would like to convert the oil industry into a business model that saves the planet rather than destroying it. And that's right. what these, these, these designs are for. These designs are, des you know, this is the new business model for the oil and gas business so that they have a, an incentive to keep doing stuff like it's great that BP is saying all the stuff about being you know renewable and everything but the electricity business is not the business they're in they're in the fuels business and what they're talking about is investing in a lot of renewable energy projects to make electricity and that's I mean to me that's a, just a kind of failure of imagination and so what we've done here is try to put our imagination to work to come up with a vision and we have another report coming out at the beginning of December, which actually goes into all the economics and kind of technology behind these designs. And 
um, you know, and it's does, it, that report is meant to be a sort of a kind of a recipe book for the oil and gas people mm. to start taking this seriously. So like you say, getting, like you say, the oil and gas companies are very, very hated and they're pro probably enjoying the glow that they, they, they receive from, from being associated with renewables. So what do you think has so far kept them from investing or being more interested in nuclear at least? Well, they don't know anything, uh, they don't know anything about, about nuclear. And if you, like I said earlier, if you think, if your view of nuclear is informed by Flamanville and Oikolutu and, and Hinckley and, you know, and frankly, the whole nuclear industry is extremely uninspiring, very, un very uninnovative and, and, you know, isn't communicating proactively about costs. They're not, they're not even, I mean, why do we have to have like nonprofit advocacy groups <laughs> telling people that nuclear is good? It's because the freaking industry has fallen down and isn't doing their job, right? They are not, you know, all the other industries tell you how good they are and tell you why you need them and tell you why their product needs to be part of the future. And the, renew the, uh, the nuclear industry doesn't do that. And so, I, you know- I couldn't agree like, more, Eric. It's yeah. crazy. I mean, we see that Boston Violent Sweden. I mean, they're the big ponchos. They, they were so ashamed that they didn't even mention they yeah. produced nuclear power up until we showed up and then they started talking about it as well. And now they're talking about fossil free as if it's natural, oh. you know, but it's, it's great. I've never, I've never come across an industry where you have such a superior product. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know, we're, we're put on our website. Well, this is the cleanest, safest, uh, most reliable energy that you can purchase. And it's like, people are, oh, that makes sense. It's not <laughs> like they're outraged. It's just like, no one's told, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> I see, and, Jerry. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, again, we're new to this party. I mean, we joined the nuclear world a year ago, a little bit over. I'm just shocked that because there's so much good statistics to back up everything. When you're in marketing, when you have laws that say you need to be able to prove that your product is X, Y, Z, when you make marketing about it, that's usually very difficult. You usually need shady statistics and weird uh, reports. <laughs> With nuclear power, you just go through the facts. How, you know, what's the capacity factor? Oh, 89%. Great. You know, that's the official number. Right. So, and then you look, so it, I'm just shocked that, that I think, I mean, for nuclear forever, probably you have had the worst PR people or the marketing teams mm. in the history. And I just don't understand how you can be so shit. Yeah. Leaders. So let me Sorry. just tell you, you a little story about this. So Kirsty and I were doing some, are doing some work in the UK and one of the there's a very interesting and actually quite are you, you going to tell our favorite joke about the, the potential no 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 no. I, I was going to tell the story about the the um climate change committee's oh, uh report that's, and, that's depressing yeah and so this was this is a report done by a sort of a, a very important advisory body to the government on how the UK is going to achieve z net zero by 2050 and we're reading through the report and we're going like, where's the nuclear? Where's the nuclear? Like they have like three nuclear plants and, you know, and they're, it's very expensive and all that stuff. And, and Kirsty met the, the woman who was in the, the chairwoman, the Baroness who was in charge of the report development. And she said, well, the only two companies came to talk to us about nuclear. And they told us that they were going to build two new plants and make them as expensive as they possibly could. And they agreed that they would be expensive. Then we, you know, we should put in like 8,000 pounds a kilowatt. So to me, that's an, a, an industry that, you know, you don't even have to take it out behind the, the, the shed and shoot it because it's shooting itself in the head, right? It's, that is an industry that is not serious about being part of the future. And, and, yeah. you know, when you, when you, when you go to the IEA, for example, Kirsty and I were involved in peer reviewing the Energy Technology Pathways report from the IEA. Um, guess who the nuclear representatives were at the meeting? Kirsty and me. Like, where the hell is the industry? And you know, I mean, China. Well, said hang on. Let me just let me spin this out right. a bit here, right? So, all you good people that. Eric and David have convened, which is so awesome. You know, this is the beginning of the, you know, 
of the change and I, when I'm seeing it already there's this you know mobilizing coming for COP26 and for those of you I know Eric you and I gosh we've done our time right at those cli climate meetings and you know being the kind of I don't know, the nuclear vigilantes showing up to <laughs> try to get a seat at the table that's going to be really really different I think in Glasgow and we need to start planning for that now and you know, nuclear needs to be as well represented at the COP as the other low carbon technologies are. That's our goal. Do, do we think the nuclear industry has a vision for for what it what it wants to do in the future? You know, I, I feel like may, they maybe have some plans, but they don't have like a vision of what yeah. nuclear is, is going to deliver. No, I, I think I think they're looking. <clears throat> You know, I think they're looking to people like you guys and us for the vision. And I'm seeing um, that it's starting to gain traction. Like I went, to, we went to the IAEA scientific forum this year, which was all about climate, all about nuclear and climate. And the new director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency, you know, is a climate hawk. And he is for the first time creating a mandate for the agency to advocate for nuclear energy um, for climate change for you know the peaceful use of the atom that's supposed to be in the mission of the IAEA that tradition like historically the IAEA has has had a position that it's not its role is not to advocate for nuclear energy that's changed now and you know we have new leadership in the World Nuclear Association with Sam Bill Balion um, <clears throat> and the stars are aligning. Um, we're seeing, you know, governments around the world mobilizing, um, and you know, the industry itself. Yeah, it has to invest in new resources and a vision and catch up. Um, but you know, the advanced reactor companies have that. They have the vision, and they're commercializing products that you know are investable and that meet future market requirements in a really different way. So I think all combined we're looking at you know the beginning of a new era um yeah uh, david did you have something to add i was just gonna well, i was just gonna say mm -hmm. i was just gonna say what you know john john was getting angry you know why, why is the industry so bad i think yeah it is bad i think it's because nuclear was traditionally sort of state-owned and so they never were supposed to advertise themselves and that's obviously changing with the, as Scotty said, the startups that have appeared because they need to sell themselves. And that's why things have changed. And people like, obviously, your company is doing that as well. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty dramatic shift. It's, it's not like they were uh, uh, never uh, uh, about advertising themselves and talking. I mean, we, we showed it earlier in the 50s and 60s. It was such an optimistic view of the future. Uh, in some yeah. ways, uh, it's it's almost uh, uh, come back to to buy or people like to to put it in the face of the industry. Oh, oh, electricity too cheap to meter. How about how's that going for you? Um, and it's disappointing because I think we all realize here if the the progress had continued and and uh, the su supply chain had continued to grow and all the experience building, uh, that too cheap to meter wouldn't be that far off. I mean, you're probably never going to go. It's actually a misquote anyway. If, if you look at the original right? speech, yeah. Oh. oh, what did he? It was um, yeah. What did he? Actually it, it was something. It was taken out of context. I can't remember the exact thing. But it, the way it's used is not actually even what what, what it was meant to be. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll look that up. Um, I Eric, yeah, Eric. Eric, there's yeah. a question. There's a, yeah, Eric. There's a question about the the GE BWRX 300 um, from yeah. from Colin. From Colin. Yeah. Uh, um, so the uh, the answer is that there's a difference between what it takes to be competitive in the in an electricity market and what it takes to make cost competitive hydrogen for the fuels market. And um, we we are uh, we have been doing a very detailed cost study for GE of the BWRX 300 for the past year, and we have you know, very detailed understanding of what their costs are likely to be and so forth. And I think they will have a product that is uh, 
a, a, a cost competitive participant on the grid. Um, I don't think that anything that costs in the two to $3,000 a kilowatt range is going to be competitive for making hydrogen. Um, Got it. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I saw a lot of questions about uh, getting the oil majors on board. And Kirsty, you mentioned you had presented earlier today to uh, an oil and gas conference. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight into how those conversations are going, what concerns they have, that kind of thing? Oh my God. We're like, <laughs> we're pushing a huge boulder up a very steep hill. <laughs> You know, what we need to do is we, what we're really doing is identifying like where the um, warm leads really are, because we can't, there's no need to boil, to boil the ocean here. So, you know, what we're going to need to do is to find, um, you know, where, where the kind of openings might be, where the people are who are not just like in the completely misinformed bracket. Mm -hmm. Um and who really want to solve the problem. We've had a, we've gained a lot of traction with the International Energy Agency um, and the, the IEA um, is, you know, has incredible convening power clearly. Um, and um, the executive director, Dr. Fati Birol is personally incredibly motivated, not only to solve climate change, but also to tackle um, uh, energy access. He leads on this sustainable development goal on energy access and is just horrified by the lack of progress in that area and the kind of neglect of that issue in the larger discourse. Um, and he's been like bringing us in to the kind of conversation. So um, I, I, you know, I suspect we're gonna be, um, we're, we're probably gonna be spending the next year talking about this. Um, and um, one of our strategies is to find um, is to build relationships with the energy consumers. So talking to the shipping and aviation industries, um, as particularly aviation, where it's really starting to feel the heat. Um, you know, the, the, those airlines are desperate for stimulus funding. Um, governments are starting to say, "Well, what's your what's your decarbonisation plan?" They don't have one. Um, people are you know starting to kind of decide to not fly because of the you know environmental impacts so those those airlines are really hungry for some for some good ideas um, yeah. and we think that if we could go to the oil companies flanked by those big customers that could really make a big difference it's kind of interesting yeah. right, that a, a lot of these companies airlines oil majors uh, have decarbonization targets uh, goals uh, that are pretty ambitious even I think uh, was it BP uh, wants to be uh, net, net carbon uh, neutral, uh, net zero by 2040 or 2050, I feel like. And uh, it's hard to imagine how they could do that without pursuing um, something like you guys presented. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Eric, were you going to say something? Yeah, I think the, the, the other thing to sort of point out here there's some interesting comments about, well, why can't you do this with existing nuclear plants or whatever? Um, you could. You could easily make hydrogen from, a, you know, at Palo Verde, for example, and put it in a pipe and send it down to Texas and stick it in an ammonia plant. Um, and then you'd have green ammonia and you'd have green ammonia from one plant. That's not scalable. Um, we've shown that we can't build new nuclear plants in the United States. Um, that's the current model for making nuclear plants is not scalable. Even the Chinese can't scale it fast enough. And, you know, they have, you know, probably the optimal conditions for, for, um, for rolling out a lot of uh, plants and they can build plants for around $2,000 a kilowatt. So cost isn't the issue that all the other issues are the issue. <laughs> so the, the, the other problem is that it's not just the nuclear plant cost. It also has to be the electrolyzer cost. It has to be the ammonia plant cost. So the reason we show an integrated ammonia production platform is that you need to make that entire plant in a factory. Um, when, you, when you get a bid for a ammonia plant today, the EPC adds uh, the, 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 a 3,600 ton a day plant. Is probably going to cost you, you know, around a billion dollars, and 
um, 30 to 40 percent of that cost is going to be related to EPC fees and on-site construction costs that are not related to the cost of the equipment. So if you can deliver that kit in a much more efficient way through a kind of factory process, um, then you have the chance of bringing the overall, the, the, the entire capital cost down, not just, um, so not just the nuclear part or, or whatever. So the, the thing to realize here is that we, that the whole plant needs to be sort of a, a manufactured item and um, it needs to be manufactured in a highly automated, highly productive environment where, you know, you have dedicated workforce, 24 hour construction, um, built in quality control, all of those things that are necessary to make these. And the other thing about this is that this, you know, when you go to a new place to build a project, one of the problems that nuclear has is, you know, how do you bring all the people with you that built the last one? And, and when you do it in a factory, you all already have all the people that built the last one. So you have real learning and you have real like, um, cost reduction curves. And that's, that's what we need. And then finally, there's some commercial considerations. One of the really nice things about building things in shipyards is that the shipyard guarantees when the project's going to be done and they guarantee the price. Mm. So this, this yeah. is pretty different from the way the nuclear plants are contracted <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It sounds like we really need to take that the makes, best Those make them financeable. So that means yeah. that you can project finance those. You can when they, when they finish, they've got it's, it goes through commissioning, it's turned on, and it works. And then you can do bond financing to basically finance those plants. And that that is, you know, it's important that the financing mechanism be scalable, not just you know the production method and so forth. So we've tried to think through all the factors that could limit the speed at which you could do these things and limit the scale of what you can do, and design those out of our vision here. Yeah, great. We are uh, at time here. I just want to thank our panelists uh, once again and uh, everyone who was able to, to join us. This is a really exciting conversation. Um, there's some links in the chat to uh, various organizations you, you see here that you can follow. And we will be uh, posting this uh, video for review on our, our various uh, channels as well. Um, there were uh, several questions we didn't get to. Uh, I'm going to look look through them, probably just copy them all into a document, see if I can bother our, our panelists to, to help us out with some of them, and we'll post those along with the video as well. Um, yeah, thank you all once again, and uh, have, have a great rest of your week, and uh, stay safe out there. So take care, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Bye.